text I will be taking a look at to start comes from the book of Colossians chapter 3. That's the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 4. And it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Okay, that comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Now, tonight, there's two perspectives we're going to look at. First, we're going to start with living under the sun, S-U-N. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to spend most of tonight, actually, in the book of Ecclesiastes. And we'll just, for time's sake, read a few select verses from the first three chapters. But you'll see that in the book of Ecclesiastes, as you're turning there, uh, Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon, right, and who was a king in the Old Testament, as many of you know. Uh, obviously had a lot of wisdom, had a lot of many things in his life. We won't go into all those, all those details tonight. But um, one of the things that he talks about in the book of, of, of Ecclesiastes is this concept or this mindset of living under the sun, right? And being basically focusing on everything that is carnal here on the earth. So he walks through that in a couple different ways. And there's a few key points I want to take out in comparing and contrast with the mindset that we should have as Christians. So starting in Ecclesiastes chapter one, we'll, let's start in verse number nine, and we'll see that one of the first times he actually uses this phrase under the sun. And it says, the thing that hath been, that is which shall be, and that which is done, which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Now, this is a very poetic book, so it may sound a little bit complicated, complex at times, so we'll break this down into modern day English. But what he's simply saying is that when he says the thing that hath been is that which shall be, there's nothing that will happen that hasn't happened before, right? That which is done, which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So whatever is happening right now, it's happened before, right? And as Christians, there's some solace we can have in that because there's not a single challenge, there's not a single temptation that faces us today that hasn't already been faced by mankind before and conquered before through Christ as well. So that can give us some perspective. But he starts off by letting us know that there really is no new thing under the sun. When you go to verse number 14, he also mentions that he's seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And that phrase vexation of spirit, when you look at the original language in the Hebrew, right? Vexation really speaks to this concept of pursuing or chasing, right? And that word spirit there is actually not referring to the Holy Spirit but actually something that's more worldly, something more like wind. So you'll see in some translations that phrase vexation of spirit might actually say, instead of vexation of spirit, it might actually say grasping for wind or striving or chasing for wind. Now, I want you to imagine for a second that it's windy outside and, you know, while, while, it, while the wind's blowing, you decide for yourself that you want to go catch the wind, right? Imagine how difficult that would be, right? Imagine feeling the wind and then running after it. How successful do you think you'd be in that endeavor, right? Solomon compares what life has to offer under the sun as both vanity, right, and as vexation of spirit, or as in chasing something, grasping for something, right, that you can't really grasp. So we'll talk a little bit more about that concept tonight as we go through the, uh, the, the second, third chapters of Ecclesiastes. And we'll start off in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse number 12. So if you, if you, again, if you're in your Bibles, turn to the next chapter, starting in verse number 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse number 12. And he starts off and says, and I turned myself to behold wisdom, madness, and folly. For what can the man do that come in, cometh after the king? So for a moment there, uh, let's, let's make, make, make this first point. You know, again, Solomon is a king. He's had many experiences in his life. Again, he's a king. I mean, he... Uh, of a, a lot at this at this point in time in the Bible. So when he says, "For what can a man do that cometh after after the king?" I mean, once you become king, what more is there, right? So he's in this process of kind of trying to search out for himself what really is the meaning of life, what more is there to do because he's acquired the wealth, right? He's acquired the power. He's done many things that most carnal men have aspired to accomplish in life, and he's now asking himself, "Well, what more is there?" So when it says, and I turn to myself to behold wisdom, madness, and folly, it's, this is, in modern day English, that's, that's, that's a way of saying that Solomon is now looking at different ways of living life 
whether it's through worldly wisdom, which we'll talk about, through madness, or through folly. Now, I want to pause here for a second because how many times do we in this side of life look to, to try to solve problems in our own way, right? He, he talks about wisdom, and we'll see what kind of wisdom he's talking about specifically. There's nothing wrong with wisdom in a nutshell, but we'll look at how it applies in this context. And when you look at madness and folly, it's interesting that when we go through things in life, if, if doing things the Bible's way seems a bit challenging, how easy is it for us to pivot to something else that seems more convenient or to pivot to something that seems a little bit easier, right? It's interesting that he openly admits to saying that he turned himself not only to wisdom, but to madness and folly. Just for a moment, does following a plan that would fall into the category of madness or folly sound like it would yield something positive for you? So one of the wisest men in the Bible, right, is sitting here and contemplating these, these ways of living his life because he himself is searching for, for more meaning. One point that we can take away from this is that when you're focused on living under the sun, it can produce a lot of unfruitful searching. Because instead of searching for truth in the place where God provided it, you search for it everywhere else. So let's continue on and see kind of what, the, what, what this actually wound up leading to as Solomon did this searching. In verse number 13, it says, Then I saw that wisdom excelleth, excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. So again, making this basic compare and contrast that, yes, it is, generally speaking, you will have a more successful life if you use wisdom more than if you use folly. Makes, makes sense, right? I don't think there's anything that's super deep theology there. But then he goes on in verse number 14 and says, the wise man, man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. So again, making this compare and contrast that the wise man's eyes are in his head, basically translating that to modern English, the wise man, you know, he might think before he acts. He might think based upon the knowledge that he has, right? And the fool walks in darkness. He, he doesn't have any path at all. He doesn't see where he's going. Now, what does the Bible say about a, man, a man's in the ways that he thinks, right? The Bible talks about how there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of destruction. So, sure, following some conventional wisdom on this side of life can get you so far, but in the end, what does it really get you? Well, Solomon goes on to talk about that. He says, I myself perceived also that one, well, let's go back to verse 14. The wise man's eyes are, are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth, to them all. Now, does it, can anyone, don't answer this out loud, but what is one event that happens to everyone that the Bible talks about? And in case you're wondering, Hebrews 9 verse 27 talks about and how it's appointed unto man once to die and then, and then the judgment. So it's interesting because Solomon takes this moment and realizes that as he's considered these different ways of living his life, whether it's someone who's wise, someone who's foolish, the end, ultimately carnally, winds up being the same. It's death, right? So he talks about this and he goes on to verse number 15 and says, Then said in, uh, in my heart, as it happened to the fool, so it happened even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this is also vanity. So you're telling me that Solomon has basically gone on this search for all of this earthly knowledge and wisdom to be able to be smarter and to make better decisions and to be able to acquire all the wealth and power that he's, he's acquired, he then compares it with the way of living his life that's more foolishly and realizes that the end for both those people is the same. That's exactly what he's saying. So what does that mean? Let's continue on, let's keep reading. For there is no, rem there is no remembrance of the wise more than the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall be all forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? So we know that we, we read in the Bible how the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Death, I mean, just because you're a Christian does not mean you won't see death. Just because you're faithful to God, just because, and, and we're not even talking about faithfulness to God quite yet, just because you've acquired some knowledge and wisdom that can help you be successful on this side of life does not mean that you won't see death either. So as he, as he goes on, he says in verse number 17, therefore I hated life. That's hate is a very strong word. But at this point, Solomon has gone through so much. He's done so much searching that he's now very upset. He says, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So put yourself in Solomon's shoes for a moment, realizing that okay, you, you've done all this work. You've acquired all of these things on the earth. And at the end of the day, 
I can still die just like the person next to me who didn't do any of this. So what does this all mean? He says, yeah, I hated all my labor, which I hated, which I, which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. So he's saying, basically, I've accumulated all this stuff. I can't bring it with me, right, after I die. So what happens after that? I have to leave it to somebody else. And verse number 19 says, and who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet, yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. So basically saying, I've worked hard to, to, do, to accomplish all of this, but when I die, I can't bring it with me. What happens to that stuff afterwards? It goes to somebody else. And it doesn't necessarily go to someone who was wise. <laughs> it could go to anybody because it's just stuff. It's just here on this side of life. So he goes on to say, therefore, I went about to cause to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For the, there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored, therein shall he leave it for his portion. This is also vanity and great evil. So let's pause here for a moment because a lot of, there's a lot of, of points we can take away from there. And I have a few of them here on the screen for you, for those of you who are taking notes tonight. So, so far, Solomon has talked about how there's nothing new under the sun, right? So anything that he's experiencing, it's something that's already been experienced before. And it's something that will also be experienced again for generations to come. At this point, he feels like most of his life is very pointless because he doesn't really see the value in putting in the work that he's putting in, ultimately because his end will be the same as the next person who maybe didn't do the, the, the who maybe didn't have the same level of wisdom or earthly knowledge that he had. He went through a process of unfruitful searching, looking for a deeper meaning and couldn't find a deeper meaning in all the land and all the things that he searched as the king, right? Again, we're talking about someone who had a lot of power here, a lot of wisdom, and in all the searching he did, he came to this conclusion that it all still wound up being vanity. So he, he realized that even with all the work that he was do doing, it was still very possible that all of the things that he had, had uh, accumulated could still wind up going to somebody else who, quote unquote, didn't deserve it. So a lot of work, potentially unfair judgment and rewards. It seemed very monotonous. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And matter of fact, let's go ahead and we'll pivot for a moment. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter three. Ecclesiastes chapter three. In verse number, we'll start in verse number one. Ecclesiastes chapter three, so same book, new chapter. Ecclesiastes chapter three and verse number one. And Solomon says, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Now, we often read this, again, the, you know, verses one through eight in the context of thinking about the, the, the seasonality of, of things in life, right? Which, again, from a Christian perspective, a lot of times can help us out because there's times where, as the minister mentioned this morning, a lot of times we're either going into a storm, we're in the midst of a storm, or we're coming out of one. Because we know there's a season for everything, we know that at some point, whatever we're going through, God will provide a way through it. We know that according to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 13 as well. So understanding the seasonality of things is nice. But from the perspective of where Solomon is in this, in this point in his life right now, I want you to look, and we're not going to reread all eight verses, but look at, if you're looking at your Bibles, what I see a lot is a time to blank, a time to blank, over and over and over and over again. Now, plug in some of the events that happen in your life, a time to go to work, a time to take a shower, a time to go to sleep, a time to eat, a time to, and it winds up being the same, same thing over and over and over again. So we begin to kind of see this concept of this monotonous life that Solomon has now grown up, has now is now experiencing because he doesn't feel the depth or the meaning of it all anymore. It's just become a habit. How many of you have ever been stuck in a rut before or felt like you were just you wanted to be able to try to do a little bit more in life, but you just felt kind of stuck and you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. As you read this and you put yourself in Solomon's shoes, you realize that he has lost sight 
of the deeper meaning of why God is putting him in these situations. And we as Christians can oftentimes do the exact same thing. Now, before we pivot to the second perspective tonight, let's drop down to verse, verses number 18 through 20, also in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. And it says, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they... That they, that they might see that they see themselves or beasts for all or actually well, let's pause there for a moment so he pauses he's, he's he basically talks about saying talking about the state of men right saying that they themselves are beasts now why is solomon basically saying that mankind is are like animals right it's basically what he's saying here he says in verse number 19 for that which that which befalleth the sons of man befalleth beasts even one thing befalleth them as one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath or one life, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast for all his vanity. Solomon at this point has is now has now lost so much of the purpose behind his living that he's now making the comparison between mankind and animals and not seeing a difference. He's now saying that again, going back to verse number 19. When he says, so that man hath no preeminence, we know that we do because we know that we were made in God's image. We know that we have souls and that the soul of man never dies. But yet because Solomon is so focused, so hyper-focused on the, this side of life between birth and carnal death, he has now lost sight of everything that comes afterward, which is so important. And as a result of that, he makes a comparison of basically saying he's like an animal. And in verse number 20, he says, all go into one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Now, let's pause for a moment there as well, too, because although, and Solomon does pivot here at multiple points throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, but take a moment and realize that there's people in this world that don't believe that there is a life after death. This is exactly the same mindset that Solomon is, is thinking through as we speak right now. If there was no life after death, then everything that Solomon is saying is logically very true. We would have the same exact ending as the animals do that, that God created as well. But what I like, though, and God always provides context, I love that God allows Solomon to capture this perspective because as I think about things that I've gone through, or maybe you've gone through some similar things, there's many things, many things that Solomon has, dedu has deduced here in this train of thought that I've personally felt myself at times as well, too. Again, when you think of, of, of we, we all have jobs or we all go to school, we all have things that keep us busy, but how often and how invested are we in those things to the point where we lose sight of what God's plan is for us? Because when we get to the point where we are so hyper-focused on the carnal side of life, on the things under the sun, S-U-N, then we begin to forget about the son that God sent to sacrifice on our behalf. So... What happens, what we see here in verses number 18 through, 18 through 20, is that Solomon has lost a lot of motivation. I don't, I don't see a man who's excited about waking up in the morning. He, he's lost a sense of purpose because he's now comparing himself to the animals and also a sense of self-respect because, again, he's now comparing himself to an animal. He's a whole human being that God has created, but he doesn't see value in himself or in his life anymore. That's a very, very scary place to be if you've ever been there. But as Christians, right? We have something that is a huge blessing for us to be able to maintain a, a better perspective and a better outlook on life. And before we go to the New Testament, we'll take a pause one more time in the book of Ecclesiastes in the same chapter. And we're going to go back, go back up. We skipped over this earlier, but Ecclesiastes chapter three, and we're going to start in verse number nine. Ecclesiastes chapter three in verse number nine. And Solomon takes a moment to instead of thinking about life under the sun, S-U-N, he pivots to something that is really more aligned with living under the sun, S-O-N, even though this is written in the Old Testament. He says, what profit, he, what profit had he that worketh in wherein he laboreth? Again, talking about what's the point of doing all this work, because we know that at the end of the day, everything that you accumulate from your work, you can't take with you, right? So he's basically asking, well, what's the point? He says in verse number 10, I have seen the travail, or I have seen the labor, I've seen the work, right? Which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Basically, I've seen the work, I've seen the labor that God has given unto mankind to go out and do. So in verse number 11, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. That's a very powerful verse because 
we read in Romans 8, 28, you know, how God uh, allows all things to work together for the good to them who are called according to his purpose. How often can we say that God has made everything beautiful in his time? We go back and we read verses one through eight. And when I think about a time to be born and a time to die, I have very, very different carnal emotions around someone being born and someone dying. But yet, according to verse number 10, Solomon is saying that God has made everything beautiful in his time. How can we find beauty in death? He'll talk about that in a moment. He talks about in verse number um, in verse number four, a time to weep and a time to laugh. I don't know about you, but I personally don't I'm not a big fan of crying. Right. I love to laugh, but I don't really want to cry. But yet again, verse number 10 mentions that God has made everything beautiful in his time. So how can we find beauty in every situation that we're in? He goes on to say in verse number continue on from verse number 11, verse number 11. Also, he has set the world in their heart. And again, reading this in the English version sometimes might be a little confusing. When you look at the Hebrew word world in verse number 11, it really speaks to ever, like everlasting life. So in some translations, you'll see the word everlasting life or eternity written there instead of the word world. So when it says also he has set the world or he has set eternity in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from beginning to end. Now, what does that mean when the Bible says that he set eternity in their heart? God has given us evidence through his scriptures that there is, in fact, a life after death. He's given us that insight. Now, no one in this room has seen the, the afterlife, right? If you have, that's a separate conversation we need to have after we leave the building. But no one has seen that. No man has seen that. However, God has given us enough information to know that it exists in what does that do for us, right? Just having the knowledge that it exists. He says, I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all that labor. It is the gift of God. So again, because we know that there's more after this, we shouldn't take this life as seriously as we often take it sometimes. Yes, it's important to work hard. Absolutely. And Solomon is not belittling that. He, he literally mentions that Part of what the gift is, from God is, is that we have the opportunity to work and to accomplish things in this side of life. We should be able to rejoice in that. We should also be able to rejoice in being able to just eat and fellowship and partake with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. He talks about that as well, too. He mentions all that as a gift of God. He says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. So if God told us, right, that he's building a place for us, we know that that will be forever. But he talks about how on this side of life, how nothing is forever. He talks about how it's very repetitive and how everything that's happened ha will, will happen again. It's carnal. It's finite. It will have an ending. But we know that we serve a God who does not have an ending, who has created a place for us that does not have an ending. And because of that, he says, again, I know, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which is that which hath been is now, and that which hath has and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. We'll break that down for one second before we move on to the New Testament. So when he says that nothing can be put to it, again, if God says that he built a place for us, who's gonna get in the way of that? If God said that he'll save his people, who's gonna get in the way of that? If God said that he'd build a church, who's going to get in the way of that? No one has ever gotten in God's way in the past, not in the present, nor in the future. So if God has made a promise unto us saying that there will be something that we can look forward to after death, then we know that we have that to look forward to. That's called hope. And having that level of hope brings a level of beauty into the things that we experience on this side of life. Because even the things that might be uncomfortable, they serve a purpose. Even for the things that are comfortable, they serve a purpose. And it's all in the greater purpose of us looking unto what comes after. So let's go ahead and pivot over to the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3. We'll go back to our scripture text for this evening. Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse number 1. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1. And it says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now, how are you risen in Christ? And I won't get ahead of, I won't jump to the plan of salvation quite yet. But... If you're wondering how, to, how how you can be risen in Christ, take a look at Romans chapter 6, verses number 3 through 6. And it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. 
Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by glory of the Father, even also we shall walk in newness of life. So again, to be raised with Christ, right, it's to be, it's to be baptized. We see that right there in verse number five. The same way that Jesus was that Jesus was, was killed, was buried, and rose again on the third day, we're able to obey that through the gospel by being baptized. And it says in verse number six, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we shall we should serve we should not serve sin. So for all those who have been baptized, what what the in the New Testament, what Paul's about to say in the book of Colossians, this applies to you. So if ye then be risen with Christ, going back to Colossians chapter three and verse number one, seek those things which are above, which Christ, um, which where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Now, reading Colossians three and verse number two after reading the book of Ecclesiastes, I think for me made a lot of made a lot of sense because when the when God says He doesn't just say set your affection on things above, right? That's important, and we're going to read in the rest of Colossians in the rest of this chapter. How exactly we do that but when he says not on things of the earth it's very important that we don't set our affection on things of the earth. that's equally as important because if we do we fall into the same trap that we saw solomon fall into in the ecclesiastes where you fall into this rut where not, not, there's nothing new everything is pointless and at the end of the day it leads to a lack of motivation a lack of self-confidence a lack of purpose and how can we be workers of God and doing go out into the world and do what he asks us to do if we're not motivated, if we don't have love and respect for ourselves and for each other. So to be able to maintain that fervor, to maintain that passion, it's very, very, very important to make sure that we're focused on the right thing, that our affection is, is instead said, set on things above and not things that are on the earth. So he goes on to say in verse number five, to be able to do this, he says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And he lists a few things. And before we get into them, mortify meaning basically to kill. Now, we just read in Romans chapter six that when you're baptized, you know, your old body, your, your, old, your old sinful ways die. Right. So we see some comparison there between and some similarity there between these two passages where Paul is saying, mortify, therefore, your members, which are therefore upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So he's he's telling us this point blank. You need to put these things away. You need to abstain away from these things, right? If you're going to be focused on God, you can't say that you're focused on God and yet do worldly things. That's simply that's the simple plain point that Paul is making right here in Colossians chapter three. Now we'll drop down for time's sake and let's take a look at verse number. Let's look, let's look at verse number ten. And it says, and have put on the new man, which again, we just finished reading about that in Romans chapter, Romans chapter six. And I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, created him. And what I love about that is that it's, it's, it uses the word knowledge here. And you'll see the word wisdom come up later as well, too. Is this the same type of knowledge that Solomon was exploring back in the Old Testament? It's not because Solomon's wisdom and knowledge was based off of in that context was based off of what he was learning in the world, was based off of what he could do to be more successful as a king. This knowledge, in fact, is based off of what God has told us to do. So is the knowledge and wisdom that we're seeking rooted in what God has commanded us, or is it rooted in what we think is beneficial for us on this side of life? Not saying that we can't benefit, right? There's a lot of things that we can learn how to do on this side of life that are helpful, they're expedient to be able to survive and to thrive, in our carnal bodies on this side of life. Nothing wrong with that. But again, the minute that becomes more important or takes a precedence over our passion or our willingness to, to obtain more wisdom and knowledge through God's word, you'll begin to see a shift in your mindset and ultimately a shift in where your mind is focused that leads to where, you, where, you, where you'll ultimately be, uh, end up. So we'll continue on. Verse number, verse number 12. Put on therefore as the elects of God, holy and beloved, Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also do ye. So Paul is now giving a lot of examples of what setting your mind on things above looks like practically in action. So he lists a few things here. First off, 
he talks so he talks about some of the actions that, that, you, that you take talking about the your mindset of being meek being patient forbearing one another he talks about forgiveness and let's continue on he talks about verse number 15 and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to which also you are you are called in one body and be ye thankful let the word of christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the lord and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now, reading Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3 and reading Colossians 3, I see two men that were writing from very different perspectives. I see a man in, in Ecclesiastes 3 who honestly felt like he was defeated by life because he no longer saw the point in it. But when I read Colossians 3, I see a man who was empowered. When I see someone who says that he can be thankful, that he can admonish and, and teach one teach others when that he can again talks about in verse number 14 putting on charity or putting on love someone who's loving someone who's forgiving these are things that should be named among us as christians and we can't we can't put on these things if our mindset is not focused on christ so setting your mindset on things above again living under the sun sun requires us to take action one of the things and this is uh this goes back to like a childhood memory uh, when i was first learning how to ride a bike um, I remember one of my older cousins actually tell, uh, actually helped me grasp the concept for the first time. And I was really nervous, right? So I was trying to, I, I, every time I would pedal, I was like, I'm gonna fall. So I would stop pedaling and then I would just, I'd fall, right? And he told me, he's like, if you wanna ride a bike, just pedal faster. And that's very dangerous advice in the wrong hands. However, in that moment, it actually works, right? Because in order for me to actually go, like you actually have to pedal. Like it's kind of, it, in 27 now it's common sense but as a child i was scared and i didn't i didn't i didn't i didn't take that action but once i once i realized okay i need to actually propel myself forward and then i'll stay i'll stay upright it worked living under the sun as someone is very much in the same way i can say okay i want to i want to get to heaven great i think most of the people in this room would agree that you have the same goal as well but how are you propelling yourself forward each day to be able to get there because you can't say that you want to get there and then not take the actions that are outlined here in the Bible, especially here in, in Colossians chapter three. So setting your mindset on things above requires you to take intentional action. So he talks about that. He gives some examples of what intentional actions look like in different roles in people's lives. So in Colossians chapter eight, three and verse 18, he talks about it from, in the marital context of wives submitting yourselves into your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And the same token, husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them. He talks about this from a, a ch a ch for the children. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And from a parental perspective, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So he's walking through, again, practical things in life that you can take, do as a Christian to help you maintain your focus on things above and not on things on the earth. Notice that at no point here has he talked about things that you can do to be more successful on this side of life. In terms of when I say successful, successful in the carnal context, he hasn't talked about ways to become more knowledgeable or how to ha or how to accumulate more wealth. He's talking about things that please God. That's purely the context of the scripture because that's purely Paul's focus when he's writing these. And as he goes on, we'll drop down for time's sake to verse number twenty-three. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, right? My parents told me growing up, if you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability, right? Don't half step things, right? So that's a very biblical concept. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Even, again, Solomon, um, going back to Ecclesiastes 3 and around verse number 9, he talks about, okay, well, what's the point of, of doing the work? Because God gave you the ability to do it. So who are we to say, oh, what's the point of this? With God, everything has a purpose. And it's important that we remember that. So doing everything to the best of our ability, according to verse 23, uh, as to the Lord and not unto men. That's, that's in, in short <laughs> summation, that is the number one reason why we should always do things to the best of our ability. Because we're not doing it for someone else. We're doing it for God. And when we do it for God, that should produce a lifestyle of service to our fellow mankind. So verse number 24 says, knowing that the Lord, uh, knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, let's com compare and contrast this again with what we read earlier. Before we saw a man who 
gained a lot of worldly wisdom knowledge, right? Re accumulated a lot of wealth and realized that the minute that he died, he wouldn't be able to take it with him, right? Whereas here in, in Colossians 3 and verse 20, in Colossians 3 and verse 24, we see that if you take on the spiritual, right, focused task, right, and you're consistent with doing this type of work, that the Lord, because he says knowing, right? So this is this is this is something that he's confident about. Knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So in contrast with things that are were carnal and that we have to leave behind here when we leave this world, it's possible for us to have a world have a reward after we die that does stay with us for eternity. And having that mindset should be able to help us continue to propel ourselves forward by, again, living in godly ways, by exemplifying the different types of things that Paul has listed here in this chapter, because our mind is focused on things above. We'll close out in this chapter in verse number 25. And Paul says, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. Now, once, one thing that's interesting, and we'll, we'll use death again as an example since Solomon used it earlier, death is also no respect of persons because it affects everyone, right? But what's beautiful about this passage is that this is in the context of judgment. So earlier on, again, back in Ecclesiastes, we see how after Solomon, you know, after a, a wealthy person, you know, dies, right, and leaves his or her possessions behind, you know, you don't, he doesn't, he or she doesn't know where that wealth is going to go. If you go to someone who's worked hard, or it could go to someone who's lazy. It could go to someone who's really knowledgeable, or it could go to someone who's foolish. But at the end of the day, it's stuff. So it doesn't it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. Here we see that the eternal reward in heaven, it it does matter what you do on this side of life. It does matter that if you live in a, a in if it, it does matter if you apply godly wisdom or if you don't. It does matter if you're in Christ or if you're not. So the decisions that we make on this side of life drastically make an impact on what happens to us afterwards. And that, for Christians, should be a motivator. It should also be a motivator for non-Christians to become Christians, because God lets us know, again, going back to Ecclesiastes, that whatever God has done, who can, who can get in the way of that? Who can take away from it, right? Although none of us have seen heaven, right, we know that if God is preparing a place for us that is above, above all that we can imagine, how much more can we work towards that than being bogged down and being caught up with the things that are happening on this side of life? So a few more scriptures before we close out this evening. First Corinthians chapter two and verse number nine says, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor have, ent nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And again, this, is, this scripture is so beautiful because it lets us know that no matter how good we think that God is, he's still better. No matter how great we think that heaven will be, it's still better. We can't comprehend how, how great and how awesome God is and what he's, what he's done for us. But yet and still, we know that, it, that as long as we're faithful, because again, the Bible talks about if we love him, we're supposed to keep his commandments. So if we, if we love him and we act based upon that love, because love's not just an emotion, we know that God has a place prepared for us that is above all that we can imagine. Now, what's interesting, I'll put it back to the slide one more time before we close out. I have here on the right side some things that basically kind of are highlighted here in Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 17 and also in Colossians 3. What, we've, what we see here is that everything, in fact, does have a purpose. We have a, Because we have a hope of heaven, we see that God is a righteous judge and will reward those who diligently seek him. We see that we see the benefits of applying godly wisdom and how that results in us living a life of service. And what it also produces, instead of having a loss of motivation, it produces faith-fueled motivation. And I made sure to use the word faith-fueled there because there's a lot of things that can motivate us on this side of life. Again, you know, I'm, I'm employed, right, as many people in the audience are. And if I didn't have a paycheck coming two Fridays from now, right, or any other Friday from now, I may not be as motivated to go to work. I, I'm sure that most of you would probably be in the same boat, unless you'd like to work for free, in which case, more power to you. But that's not me. So if, you know, if you're someone that's motivated by that, cool. But faith-fueled motivation is rooted in the fact that we know what we know what God will provide for us. We know what reward he has for us. So it's interesting that a lot of times we're, off, we're oftentimes more motivated by things that allure us on this side of life than we are 
about things that God has promised for us. So if we know that God has prepared a place that is above all that we can imagine, why is it so easy for us to be focused on things that are here on this side of life and instead of be motivated by that? Even knowing that we can't take anything of this, we can't take anything in this world with us. We can't, we can't, we can't protect it. We can't choose who it goes to. To some extent we can, but in, in, all, in reality, it still winds up all being vanity. And as Solomon says, vexation of spirit. So understanding the rewards that we have in Christ should hopefully help motivate us to maintain that mindset, which produces godly actions. And to close out, again, John chapter 14 and verse number one through six, uh, it says, let not, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if you're reading this in your Bibles, these, these words are in red. This is Jesus himself talking. He says, verse number three, and I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I, whether I go, ye know, in the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether, that, whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if we're, if we're people who are seeking to get to heaven, if we're people seeking to have that godly reward, realizing that we ultimately can never be satisfied, we never can be saved, we never can be ultimately joyful or happy in purely in just the benefits of this side of life because it's all temporary we need something eternal and that's why god created created salvation for us so for us to have access to that, that access to that salvation we have access to it through christ jesus uh through christ god's son and that plan is outlined throughout the bible i have a few scriptures on the screen in case for, in case there's anyone here who has not obeyed the plan of salvation we're supposed to hear and believe something that's called the gospel and I saw in the book of First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. We paraphrased that a bit earlier in Romans 6, but it's simply that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And because of that, we also have the opportunity to repent of our sins because 2 Peter 3 and 9 lets us know that God wants all men to repent. We're supposed to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, just as our new brother in Christ did this morning. And again, just as we talked about in Romans 6, and also in Acts chapter 8 and verse 238 mentions this as well, we're supposed to be baptized for the mission of our sins and then live faithfully unto death. And as we live faithfully, we're supposed to maintain that mindset, focus on things above, not on things of the earth, because ultimately we all want to be able to have that crown of life and that eternal reward in heaven. Now, whether you're a Christian or you're someone who seeks to be saved, you can come forth now as we sing our song of encouragement. Thank you. Time. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus.